You are listening to another episode of No Fair Remembering Stuff, the Tuesday edition of the Professional Left Podcast, and available wherever you get your podcasts and at our website, proleftpod.com, where you can also contribute to this podcast. There is a Patreon button at our website, or you can mail us a letter and or contribution at the Professional Left Podcast, P.O. Box 9133, Springfield, Illinois, 62791. And it's not safe for work. Today, we begin our dive into the forgotten past with something that happened last week. Yeah, that that seems crazy, Blue Gal. This is no fair remembering I'm always grateful when when we find out time is a circle. Yeah, it's a flat (laughs) circle and it smells bad. And with Republicans, it often is. Yeah. After getting thoroughly spanked once again on his bullshit witch hunt committee by Democrats who simply read him the rules, committee chairman Jim Jordan ran over to his safe space on Fox News to strongly suggest to Maria Bartiromo that he's going to launch even more witch hunts. That's the cure to witch hunts is more witch hunts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it. And he may even try to drag Hillary Clinton back again to face another bunch of Republican thugs over another imaginary offense against God and country. This is from Raw Story two days ago. Quote, nothing is off the table. <laughs> yeah. Jim Jordan threatens Hillary Clinton probe in Fox News meltdown. Uh, Representative Jim Jordan, chairman of the House Judiciary Committee, threatened to investigate Bill and Hillary Clinton during a Sunday interview on Fox New- News. Host Maria Bartiromo asked an animated Jordan if he would consider opening an investigation into the Clintons. Do you want to see another investigation of Hillary and Bill Clinton? Bartiromo wondered. Because in the Durham report, John Ooh. Durham wrote that while they were pursuing Trump, they made no effort to investigate the claim that Hillary Clinton was taking money from foreigners for her Clinton Global Initiative and the Clinton Foundation. Huh? What about that? Huh? What about it? John Durham? Yeah. That's not illegal. No. And it's not what uh, claim from what asshole with yeah, Jim and what Jordan claim and yeah. yeah. Okay. They not only didn't investigate her like they did president Trump, they gave her campaign a defensive briefing exclamation point. Jordan exclaimed they should have done the same for president Trump because they literally had no evidence. Uh-huh. Unquote. Of course, you know, they already knew Donald Trump was obstructing justice all over the place. Yeah. And uh, I found out today that uh, Jack Smith has subpoenaed records from the uh, Trump organization on all of the foreign money he made while president. Oh, but that's, so that'll that's be okay. interesting. That's perfectly OK. That's just let's not even talk about it. Let's move on, Blue Gal. Let's we don't have time for that. Let's move on <laughs> with our I'll podcast. tell you what we should do, Driftglass. What should we do? Let's all put on our remembering caps and see if we can remember the many, many other times Republicans have used this bullshit investigation tactic. <laughs> We're going to recap a few of them because they're instructive. Uh, you know, it occurs to me that if we're if we're looking for merch ideas, uh, professional podcast remembering caps might be just <laughs> freaking the thing that will pay for our health care. Because Member, memory is the liberal superpower caps is what yeah. we need. Just yeah. just remembering cap. Put on your remembering cap, everyone. And then, <laughs> well, <clears throat> you know. All right. Well, in 2015, there was, of course, the Republican House Benghazi Select Committee being run by, you remember, a nasty, a humorless punk named Trey Gowdy. Oh, and, yeah. Yeah, remember Trey? Haystack head, misshapen, weirdo. Uh, the last day was see, saw him walking out of Congress in his dad's suit, looking real sad that he never got anything done. Um, that committee was convened for the sole purpose of driving down Hillary Clinton's electability numbers in advance of her 2016 run for president. Now, by most press accounts that we've looked up, Hillary Clinton's testimony was triumphant, was treated like a triumph uh, by most non-Fox News outlets. And this is a sample from Vox from October 22nd, 2015. Quote, Hillary Clinton's 11-hour Benghazi testimony was her best campaign ad. 
She's definitely going to win, Blue Gal. She's definitely going to win. She's going to win. Republicans will kick themselves for dragging Hillary Clinton before the House Benghazi Committee Thursday. It was a defining moment for Clinton's presidential aspirations. She handled the GOP's questions with aplomb and without the patina of partisanship that has characterized the committee since its conception. That would have been bad enough for Republicans' hopes to seize the White House in 2017, but she did much more than that. She answered questions that Republicans have been hanging out there in hopes of sowing doubt among voters. Does she believe in American exceptionalism? Yes. Can she be nonpartisan, serious, and policy-minded? Yes. Is her mental acuity superior to pretty much anyone you know? Yes. Is she human? Yes. And does she have the energy to be president? Yes. Unquote. Now, as we said, most press accounts agreed with that. And we, you and I, Blue Gal, also agreed with all of that, except for the part about Republicans kicking themselves for dragging Hillary Clinton before their bullshit committee, because the point of putting her under oath and grilling her for 11 hours had nothing to do with the merits of her patient professional testimony. Now, if they could have tricked her into one unflattering soundbite during that 11 hours, um, Fox News would have beat that into the ground. But the fact that that didn't happen didn't matter because Fox News zombies and Head in the Sand independents didn't hear any of Hillary Clinton's nonpartisan, serious, and policy-minded testimony anyway. Didn't matter. Instead, all they knew was that she was being investigated. Ooh. And that it was serious. Oh, no. Possibly impeachable. Oh, no. Instead, all they heard were five words taken wildly out of context from her testimony from two years earlier, and they heard that over and over and over again. And that was the what difference would it have made right. words. Oh. And so here they are in context. Yeah. They didn't know that. With all due respect, the fact is we had four dead Americans. Was it I because understand. of a protest or was it because of guys out for a walk one night who decided they'd go kill some Americans? What difference at this point does it make? It is our job to figure out what happened and do everything we can to prevent it from ever happening again, Senator. Now, honestly, I will do my best to answer your questions about this. But the the fact is that people were trying in real time to get to the best information. The IC has a process, I understand, going with the other committees to explain how these talking points came out. But... You know, to be clear, it is, from my perspective, less important today, looking backwards, as to why these militants decided they did it than to find them and bring them to justice. And then maybe we'll figure out what was going on in the meantime. Yeah. And all the Republicans jumped on the, here's why it matters, Hillary. And Marco Rubio was emphatically not what she said or meant, and they damn well knew it, but they clipped five words out of context from two years before, and they beat her into the ground with that. And how do we know the Republican House Benghazi Select Committee was a witch hunt convened for the sole purpose of trying to drive down Hillary Clinton's numbers in advance of her 2016 run for president? Because Kevin McCarthy told us so. Everybody thought Hillary Clinton was unbeatable, right? But we put together a Benghazi special committee. A select committee. What are her numbers today? Her numbers are dropping. Why? Because she's untrustable. But no one would have known any of that had happened had we not thought and made that happen. something good. I give you credit for that. I give you credit for that. Because you see, Kevin McCarthy is a moron, and that moron is now Speaker of the House and third in line for the presidency. He really is not very bright. He's an idiot who could be piloted like a drone by Marjorie Taylor Greene, which is his only use, his only utility. Yep. This was the same kind of thing Donald Trump tried and failed to pull with the government of Ukraine. Remember, blackmailing the government of Ukraine into announcing that they were launching an investigation into the Biden family for the express purpose of turning that fabricated announcement into a weapon to drive down Joe Biden's electability numbers in advance of the 2020 election. That was his first impeachment. Right. Another example, the Mueller report, which down in the details is absolutely damning. But since Bob Mueller turned out to be a frankly timid old man who steadfastly refused to explain the implications of his own report, instead of indictments and impeachment, we got Bill Barr with his four-page inaccurate summary, 
lying about the contents of the report, which was still mostly under wraps and declaring that Trump had been completely exonerated and that everyone should just move on while Mueller sat on his ancient ass, got admit it, and uh, never said otherwise. Didn't jump up to a microphone and say, oh. hey, my boss is lying. Nope, because, you know, he's an institutionalist and you have to hmm. follow the procedures. And and that's how the Mueller report turned into a disaster. This has been part of the Republican playbook for decades. If the established facts aren't what you want them to be, if they exonerate your enemies or implicate you or just don't fit whatever campaign strategy you're rolling out, just ignore them and try to get your own investigation going, staffed with political hacks who will deliver whatever content Fox News needs to feed its audience. Yep. Now, so with all that in mind, we're going to go now to a press conference by the Attorney General of the United States. <clears throat> Quote, This morning I am announcing that I've asked Robert Fisk Jr. to serve as independent counsel in the Madison Bank matter. He has accepted. A week ago, I said I was looking for someone who would be fair and impartial, who has a reputation for integrity and skill, someone who would be ruggedly independent, and I think Mr. Fisk fits that description to a T. He is an excellent prosecutor, having served with distinction as an assistant U.S. attorney in the criminal division and as head of the special prosecutions unit on the organized crime in the Southern District of New York. He was appointed U.S. attorney by a Republican president, and his principles, his integrity, and his ability caused the subsequent president to continue him in that office. He exemplifies public service at its best, and I am enormously grateful that he has heeded the call one more time. I have talked with Mr. Fisk and told him I want him to do everything he thinks proper and appropriate to make sure that he is truly independent. Mr. Fisk, unquote. For those of you who don't know, that was Janet Reno on January 20th of 1994 announcing the appointment of Robert Fisk, someone whose name has almost been lost to history, as the first independent counsel of the Madison Bank matter, which would subsequently be known as Whitewater. Right. And so this is Robert Fisk responding to Janet Reno. He said, quote, thank you. I'm very grateful to the attorney general for the trust and confidence that she has placed in me to carry out this important assignment. I am totally satisfied that I will have the independence and complete authority to do this job right. Starting Monday, I am going to take a leave of absence from my law firm so that I can work full time to conduct and complete as expeditiously as possible. That's kind of an important phrase there. Uh -huh. A complete, thorough, and impartial investigation, unquote. Fisk then opened the floor for questions. And the first one right out of the gate was, quote, what will be the scope of this investigation and will it include Mr. Foster's suicide, unquote? Jesus, yeah. Yep. At the time of this press conference in January of 1994, Robert Fisk was universally praised by Republicans. And by August of 1994, Fisk was out of a job. Mm -hmm. Pursuant to the newly reauthorized Ethics in Government Act, Kenneth Starr was appointed by a special three-judge division of the D.C. Circuit to replace Fisk and continue the Whitewater investigation. So why not just reappoint Fisk under the new Ethics in Government Act? After all, Republicans had praised him, and he was delivering on exactly what he had promised to do, to complete as expeditiously as possible a complete thorough and impartial investigation. But that is not what Republicans wanted. One of the subjects that we touch on, on No Fair Remembering Stuff, which is really important to understand about politics, is how deeply Republicans hated Bill Clinton. And since he had won in 1992 with a plurality of the popular vote and not a straight majority, many Republicans simply never accepted him as legitimate. This article from the American Prospect in October of 2008 looks back on the Clinton years. Quote, It's worth remembering just how virulent the opposition to Clinton's presidency was. Republicans began plotting to impeach Clinton long before anybody had ever heard the name Lewinsky, and many on the right simply refused to accept he was legitimately elected to the office he held. Then House Majority Leader Dick Armey, remember Dick Armey, the guy mm -hmm. who uh, ran the Tea Party? 
when talking to Democrats, used to refer to Clinton as your president. Even Bob Dole admitted, quote, we had a pretty hard right group in the party who were just never going to accept him. And Clinton didn't even steal an election. The efforts range from those inside political institutions, like the endless string of congressional hearings into trumped up scandals, culminating in impeachment, to the independent and thoroughly unhinged. There were books charging that the Clintons were guilty of all manner of offenses against decency, like the one that claimed Hillary Clinton had decorated the White House Christmas tree with crack pipes. There was the obsession with Vince Foster's suicide, a death that birthed more conspiracy theories than any since JFK's. Then there was the Clinton Chronicles, a video that charged that not only was Bill Clinton the head of a cocaine smuggling operation, but that he had also arranged for the murder of dozens of his enemies and political opponents. It may sound like nothing more than lunatic ravings of the kind that today you'd find on the most obscure websites, but hundreds of thousands of copies were distributed thanks to the efforts of Jerry Falwell, a close friend of Republican presidents and politicians. Such was the burning fire of their hatred that some conservatives kept on writing books about how awful Clinton was even after he left office, unquote. So Republicans had no use for the thorough and impartial investigator who'd found that Vince Foster had committed suicide and the Whitewater was a nothing burger, a land deal on which the Clintons lost money. They needed a partisan conservative kill bot with unlimited authority, an unlimited budget, and no deadlines. They needed a virtual fourth branch of government that would be answerable to no one and could keep chasing down rumors and conspiracies until, damn it, he found something that Republicans could use to take down Bill Clinton. And in Ken Starr, they found just such a willing foot soldier in the conservative culture war. Robert Fisk's tenure as special prosecutor lasted less than eight months, and by the time he was fired in favor of Starr, he had pretty much debunked all the rumors and cleared the Clintons of all the charges against them. By contrast, Starr's tenure as a partisan Republican saboteur would last five years and would dig into and leak out every vagrant Arkansas fishing shack rumor about the Clintons. And you know what, Blue Gal? You know what? It fucking well worked. Mm -hmm. Starr provided the GOP with a bounty of political slander that it had wanted forever. He provided networks with regular doses of salacious details about sex and infidelity that they sopped up with a biscuit. He contributed heavily to the creation and early success of MSNBC, which was launched on July 15th, 1996, and Fox News, which launched on October 7th, also in 1996. And let's not forget the rocket fuel this garbage provided to the right-wing blogosphere during its early formative years. Mm -hmm. From The Observer, February 2nd, 1998, the media mudslide led by Matt Drudge into the Clinton muck. On January 21st, the Washington Post became the first mainstream media outlet to follow the Drudge Report in breaking news of the Monica Lewinsky-Bill Clinton tangle followed quickly by the L.A. Times and ABC Radio. The New York Times was nowhere to be found. I'm sorry to say that we were flat-footed Wednesday morning, said Times executive editor Joe Lelyveld. The Times did not pick up on the hint, as Lelyveld put it, in either the original Drudge Report item on January 17th about Newsweek holding its story, or the mention of it the next morning on ABC's This Week. We should have and we didn't, he said. The people who missed these signals know who they are and aren't going to do it again, he added. Mr. Lelyveld declined to name names. The Washington Post has owned this story more than any other newspaper in the country, and the feeding frenzy that has accompanied the scoops has resulted in some celebration. Mm -hmm. Ben Bradley, the executive editor during Watergate, who passed on his mantle to Leonard Downey seven years ago, dropped by the newsroom on January 21st. He headed over to Mr. Downey's office on the fifth floor, where the executive editor was meeting with managing editor Robert G. Kaiser. Outside the glass partition separating the office from the newsroom, 
Mr. Bradley held up a sheet of paper upon which he had written one word. Sizzle! He gave us a big thumbs up, and we felt good, said Mr. Kaiser. Mm -hmm. For many members of the responsible press, the apocalypse arrived on January 25th at 10.30 a.m. on NBC. Matt Drudge was a panelist on Meet the Press. Mm -hmm. Mr. Drudge, a one-man operation spreading political media and celebrity gossip around the World Wide Web, remember when they called it that, Drift Glass? Uh, I, I do. Was not there to be grilled for his questionable journalistic practices. No, he was there sitting next to New York Times' William Sapphire as an esteemed member of the press pursuing the scandal surrounding President Clinton. Tom Shales, in the January 26th Washington Post, was repulsed. Drudge, as sleazy-looking a character as anyone involved in the case so far, and that is saying something, has no credentials whatever to serve on a panel with professional journalists or even professional pundits, he wrote. His only credential is his computer. Drudge's sudden rise to fame and now Tim Russert's implied endorsement of him may be but one small sign of the new electronic Tower of Babel that the Internet will become. Unquote. And it did. It absolutely did. Oh, and let's not forget that Starr also brought about the impeachment of an American president over a blowjob. Yeah, let's not let's not let that slip past. And for his sins, on April 6, 2004, Starr was appointed dean of the Pepperdine University School of Law. And in a final irony, on January 16, 2020, Starr was announced as a member of then-President Donald Trump's legal team for his Senate impeachment trial. He argued before the Senate on Trump's behalf on January 27, 2020 and contradicted pretty much every argument he used in 1998 to justify Clinton's impeachment. But more than all of that, it added a whole chapter to the Republican slash-and-burn political playbook that is still in use by that party to this very day. Yep. Uh, so, for example, the fact that Starr reopened the investigation into the death of Vince Foster which Robert Fisk had already concluded was a tragic suicide that had nothing to do with the Clintons. This part of Starr's investigation, so-called, dragged on for three years, until October of 1997, when Starr finally released a report on Foster's death that was a virtual copy of Fisk's 1994 investigation. Fun fact, you may not remember this, that report was drafted by a young up-and-coming deputy of, of Ken Starr's named Brett Kavanaugh. What ever happened to that guy? Yeah. So by dragging this already closed case out for three additional years, Starr gave the rapidly growing conservative political media machine enough time to pound it into the heads of the GOP base that Foster was definitely murdered on the orders of the Clintons, just as it had already begun running rumors about Clinton's drug dealing and Clinton's having political opponents murdered. It should come as no surprise to anyone that behind the plot to destroy the Clintons, there was, surprise, a crackpot right-wing billionaire. Because hasn't that always been the case with every other conservative conspiracy to destroy the opposition by lies and sedition? There is always a proto-fascist billionaire or two or three waiting and willing to bankroll the whole project. In this case, the plot was called the Arkansas Project, and it was financed by a man named Richard Mellon Scaife, who is not as well-remembered as, say, the Koch brothers, but he really should be, because without his money, the modern conservative movement and Republican Party would look nothing like they do today. This is from the Washington Post, May 2nd, 1999. Scaife, funding father of the right. One August day in 1994, while gossiping about politics over lunch on Nantucket, Richard Mellon Scaife, the Pittsburgh billionaire and patron of conservative causes, made a prediction. We're going to get Clinton. Joan Bingham, a New York publisher present at the lunch, remembers him saying, and you'll be much happier, he said to Bingham and another Democrat at the table, because Al Gore will be president. Uh -huh. Bingham was startled at the time, but in the years since, as Clinton has struggled with an onslaught from political enemies, Scaife's assertion 
came to seem less and less far-fetched. Scaife did get involved in numerous anti-Clinton activities. He gave $2.3 million to the American Spectator magazine to dig up dirt on Clinton and supported other conservative groups that harassed the president and his administration. The White House and its allies responded by fingering Scaife as the central figure in a vast right-wing conspiracy that has been conspiring against my husband since the day he announced for president, as Hillary Rodham Clinton described it. James Carville, Clinton's former campaign aide and rabid defender, called Scaife, quote, the arch-conservative godfather in a heavily funded war against the president, unquote. But people who know him well say that although Scaife is fond of conspiracy theories of many kinds, he is incapable of managing any sort of grand conspiracy himself. And months of reporting produce no evidence of his orchestrating any effort to, quote, get, unquote, Clinton beyond his financial support. Indeed, focusing on his role in the crusade against Clinton can obscure the 66-year-old philanthropist's real importance, which is not based on his opposition or support for any individual politicians, although he once gave Richard M. Nixon $1 million. His biggest contribution has been to help fund the creation of the modern conservative movement in America. By compiling a computerized record of nearly all his contributions over the last four decades, the Washington Post found that Scaife and his family's charitable entities have given at least $340 million to conservative causes and institutions, about $620 million in current dollars adjusted for inflation, at which it, when adjusted for inflation comes to nearly $2 billion in 2023. His money has established or sustained activist think tanks that have created and marketed conservative ideas from welfare reform to enhanced missile defense, public interest law firms that have won important court cases on affirmative action, property rights, and how to conduct the national census. Yeah. Organizations and publications that have nurtured conservatism on American campuses. Academic institutions that have employed and promoted the work of conservative intellectuals, watchdog groups that have critiqued and harassed media organizations, and many more. Together, these groups constitute a conservative intellectual infrastructure that provided ideas and human talent that helped Ronald Reagan initiate a new Republican era in 1980 and helped Newt Gingrich initiate another one in 1994. Conservative ideas, once dismissed as flaky or extreme, moved into the mainstream. And as the Liberal National Committee for Responsive Philanthropy concluded in a recent report, quote, the long-standing conservative crusade to discredit government as a vehicle for societal progress has come to fruition as never before, unquote. Now, one other reason we're bringing Scaife and his billions into the conversation is that, well, the name of our podcast is No Fair Remembering Stuff. Yeah. And we don't have a billionaire funder. <laughs> no, no. We have you lovely And, and liberals don't. I mean, liberals no. just don't have this kind of infrastructure well, because we never had this kind of money thrown and, at and us. And just sort of part of what we have not discovered, but what, what's come clear over the decades is that there's just so much money on the right. There's yep. just so billions and billions and billions of dollars from local billionaires, from crackpots in the United States, more money coming in from foreign countries willing to fund uh, fa uh, fascism and authoritarianism in this country. It's just an insane amount of money. And, and you know, you can get all excited about doing a blog and doing a podcast, et cetera, but you are up against just a, a mountain of power that is not going to stop until it's destroyed. And that is the thing that we want to drive home is that this didn't happen in 2015. This started yeah. a long time ago and they have invested the patient capital of fascism in the right, in their billions for decades. And that's the system that you're up against. Yep. So uh, two of the many books that were spawned by the conservative Vince Foster conspiracy factory that Richard Mellon Scaife financed, 
Vincent Foster, The Ruddy Investigation, published in 1996, and, quote, The Strange Death of Vincent Foster, An Investigation, unquote, published in 1997, were both written by a thug named Christopher Ruddy. Based on the stories Ruddy was running in the Pittsburgh Tribune Review, which was owned by Richard Mellon Scaife. Yeah, shocking. And yeah. I, I personally know people, Republican business owners and Republican pillars of the Springfield establishment, who still absolutely believe this filth and still have those books on their bookshelves. And who will, if prompted in any way, like showing up to an event as a liberal, will hold forth on the subjects like ligature marks on Vince Foster's body and the placement of the body. And as as if they were experts in the field, this is how deep and old the propaganda goes and how lodged in their brain it is. Now, in February of 1997, when the Star report on the Foster suicide was finally published, CNN reported that, quote, despite these findings, right wing political groups have continued to allege that there was more to the death and that the president and the first lady tried to cover it up, unquote. CNN at the time also noted organizations pushing the murder theory included the Pittsburgh Tribune Review, owned by billionaire Richard Mellon Scaife, and Accuracy in Media, supported in part by Scaife's foundation, Scaife's reporter on the White House matter, Christopher Ruddy, who was also a frequent critic of stars handling the case. Now, you may have noticed over time that every time another big, ridiculous conservative conspiracy theory collapses, it is quickly replaced by another even bigger, even more ridiculous conspiracy theory, which is why you won't be shocked that Ruddy explained away the Star investigation as part of the conspiracy. <laughs> <clears throat> Colin Ken Starr, a quote, patsy for the Clintonites and those that believe that the stability and reputation of America is more important than justice, unquote. So you may be asking yourself, hey, what the hell is this Christopher Ruddy up to these days? <laughs> well, Christopher Ruddy is the CEO and majority owner of Newsmax Media and the trusted confidant of a gentleman named Donald J. Trump. It never ends. It never and, and there's never any accountability. There's never any cost to be paid for, for being this way. No, ever. You're, you're paid for the loyalty. Yep. They remember the loyalty that you had. So by the mid-1990s, anyone who was paying any serious attention to politics and media could clearly see what was happening on the right. There was the termination of the media fairness doctrine by Ronald Reagan, Robert Bork, and Antonin Scalia in the late 1980s, followed immediately by the nationwide syndication of Rush Limbaugh and his many imitators, the ascension of Gingrich-style slash-and-burn politics in the GOP, the central role Limbaugh and Hate Radio played in Gingrich and the GOP sweeping to power in 1994. Don't forget, they gave Limbaugh a plaque, called him the majority maker. The unprecedented flood of money that was poured into building extreme right-wing think tanks, political action committees, and media platforms. Using all of these tools to relentlessly browbeat and intimidate the mainstream media weaponizing the media's both-sides-do-it fetish to make criticism of Republican depravity virtually impossible, and making the decision that from now on, the central organizing principle would be to take power by any means necessary and use every tool at their disposal to destroy the Democratic Party and sabotage any Democrat who might win the White House, all swaddled in their fake patriotism and fake Christian piety. And decades later, we can see that the doomsday machine they built is still operating exactly as designed. To bring it all home, this is the machinery that was firmly in place and ready to go when a tyrant named Donald Trump took over the Republican Party. Instead of a Brooks Brothers riot, we had a January insurrection. Instead of Ken Starr, we have Jim Jordan and John Durham. Instead of Rush Limbaugh, we have Fox, CNN, Newsmax, conservative radio, a thousand right-wing podcasts, and Facebook and Truth Social, not to mention Twitter. Yeah, it, it was all there, ready to go, gassed up, powered, built to do exactly what it was doing all along. And Trump just 
was more Rush Limbaugh than any other candidate. Exactly. He he sounded like Sean Hannity and Rush Limbaugh had a baby. Yeah. And that made Republican base voters think that he was speaking their language. Yeah. And the, the constant refrain during the 2015 primaries was, he's saying what I'm thinking. Exactly. Well, what you were thinking is all of the stuff that's being pounded into your brain all day on hate radio and on Fox. Yeah. And the difference between Trump and every other candidate in 2015 was all of those people, um, all Republicans throughout the last 30 years, were willing to job out the, the, the work of trashing the left and feeding racism to the right and so forth, using dog whistles or third parties, et cetera. Donald Trump came to the podium and said, don't be ashamed to be a racist asshole. I'm a racist asshole. We're all racist assholes here. And immigrants are murderers and rapists. And he told them directly in blunt Limbaugh language, mm-hmm. what Jeb and everybody else would hint at and wink at, but treat kind of as a shameful secret. Now, the people who yeah. knew what was going on were liberals who'd been warning right. <laughs> that this sort of thing was going to blow up in their face for decades. And nobody listened and nobody cared. They built this doomsday machine with a perfect attack uh, mechanism inside of it. You know, fake hearings, lying all the time, attacking the press, and anybody who says otherwise is either a rhino or a member of the liberal conspiracy. And Donald Trump just comes along, reads the language that had been trained the base as their mother tongue by Rush Limbaugh and Sean Hannity for 30 years and spoke to them in their own language. And they nominated him over the objection of all these clever people who said this never happened. And they elected him over all the terrorized pundits who said this could never possibly happen. Mm -hmm. And he simply took possession of a machine that Republicans had spent decades building and perfecting. Well, and I think the Republican establishment and his ability to run against it, particularly since the Republican establishment had decided that Jeb Bush was going to be the nominee. Absolutely. And so he pointed to Jeb Bush and said, your brother didn't keep us safe. Right. And all of the embarrassment that the Republican base had had to turn into the Tea Party in order to avoid was still facing with their friends and neighbors. Yep. They could point and say, no, it's not us. We didn't go along with George W. Bush. It's Jeb's fault. It's Jeb's fault. We're with Trump. <clears throat> and you want to give us a, another Bush. Right. You know, right. We, fuck that George Bush guy. Who supported right. him in the first Even place anyway? We overwhelmingly voted for yeah. him twice. And, yes. And no, Trump, no, no, no. <laughs> Trump gave them what they wanted. He gave yeah. them uh, absolution. He Get left- out of Bush free card. Yeah. yeah. He yeah. let them pretend that they had nothing to do with this, that they were an innocent victim, that they'd been bamboozled by the deep state, by the uniparty, mm-hmm, blah, blah, mm-hmm. blah, 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 and that he would smash the people who had made them look stupid. The problem is the people that had made them look stupid were them. The right. base are the right. problem. The voters are the problem. And this – Going all the way back to before the Fisk report, before going back to Reagan, these are people who've been conditioned to believe that that they're never wrong, that people like you and I, Blue Gal, are are enemies, are monsters mm-hmm. to be destroyed. Mm-hmm. And Donald Trump just came along and said, "I will, I will be your vengeance. I will I'm be your, your champion. Yeah, I'm be cha- I, I will fight against all these people. I'm incorruptible because I'm rich. I don't care about money." And he. He played every key on the organ. Where, where well, again, and, and this gets a little us a little off topic, but uh, we I think we can end by saying you know there would be no January sixth had there been no Bush v. Gore. Oh yeah, absolutely. Donald Trump had stacked the Supreme Court to select him as president if there was chaos after the election. Mm-hmm. So he created chaos. He did, and he thought that that might just work if if Pence would go along with it, and say, oh, no, we we, do, we really don't have a slate of electors here. Right. We're going to have to figure out what to do. We can't actually elect a president today or formalize Joe Biden's election. It gets tossed to the Supreme Court. He's chosen three of them yeah. to, to tilt the balance for himself as president for another four years. And that keeps him out of jail. You know what, Blue Gal, it's no fair remembering that the last time a presidential election got thrown to the courts it was a bunch of conservative judges who appointed george bush president and it was roger stone orchestrating so much of it and that's exactly who was orchestrating trump 2020 yep and wanting to get to the violence he was there in the hotel in dc on january 6th talking to the proud boys yep 
fomenting well, chaos for the purpose of maintaining power. Well, like you said, instead of the Brooks Brothers riot, we had a January insurrection. We had January 6th riot. Yeah. 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 Instead of a Florida polling place, we had the Capitol itself stormed. The same mentality, though, the same idea that Absolutely. we deserve power by any means necessary. And we stack the system to, if we create enough chaos and throw this matter back to the states, into the courts, my pals I just appointed on the Supreme Court, the, the seat I stole mm-hmm. to make it a majority um, will give me the presidency. And that was yeah. that was roughly the plan. There was I, I don't believe there was a step by step at ten o'clock this will happen, eleven o'clock this will happen. No, was, he didn't have that detail, it was but just it didn't matter. Chaos. Just cause a lot of chaos, get it into the hands of friendly people who can decide on my uh my behalf, and then just refuse to leave. Mm-hmm. Just mm-hmm. refuse to leave until the Supreme Court says, Well, you know, uh just oof. for the for the sake of peace and the nation, we have yeah. to go with the incumbent president, which yeah. is what they did with Bush v. Gore. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh I I would like to leave it there. Uh and I will refrain from mentioning um all of the uh the stuff I'm seeing today from uh reported through Margaret Hoover, I think. Charlie Sykes talking about, you know, Rush Limbaugh was a man who brought unprincipled behavior to politics. And I'm like, dude, where was this revelation during all of the time you and I have just talked about from 1994 until yesterday? When you were Wisconsin's Rush Limbaugh. When you were Wisconsin's Rush Limbaugh. Talking about stop the steal with the recall election in Wisconsin. And that's why control of the media is so important. Once the people who want to lie about the past, who don't want to remember stuff, who think it's no fair to remember stuff, were allowed to colonize the media and control the conversation, it was game over. Because now every bad thing that ever happened in the Republican Party began on, on in 2015 and 2016. Liberals are probably f- at least 50% to blame. And we'll just leave it there, Blue Gal, because we don't have time. <laughs> we need your support to we make do. this podcast fly. We do not have a Richard Melonscape funding our show. Nope. Uh, we spend about 20% of your donations on health insurance and co-pays. Mm-hmm. So if you can help us, uh, we would appreciate it. We are at paypal.me slash proleftpodcast or patreon.com slash proleftpod. And again, we really appreciate your support. See you next time. See you next time. The Professional F Podcast No Fair Remembering Stuff Tuesday edition is produced under a Creative Commons license. Copyright 2022-23, DGBG Productions.